Hi, I'm attorney Greg Dell, and I'm here today with attorney Alex Palomara. Hello. And today we're going to discuss with you a very recent case against Aetna Disability Insurance Company that came out of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which means that this was a case that was initially in the District Court of Kansas, Correct. and then went up on appeal after the claimant was denied to the Circuit Court, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers cases for multiple states around the Kansas area. So. Every week we talk about all different cases from disability insurance companies around the country and this was a, one of the most recent decisions so we wanted to share this information with you whether you're an Aetna disability claimant or any disability claimant so that hopefully you can learn from this and hopefully allow this information to help you protect your benefits. So Alex, what can you tell us about this recent case regarding a former Boeing employee? Well this case is literally brand new and the reason why we're bringing it up to you because it has a lot of issues that our clients will see on a regular basis. Um, this client worked for years at Boeing. Uh, he left work in 2005 due to multiple conditions, but mostly uh, irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, uh, PTSD, and depression, and some minor neck and back issues. But this case is very, um, it's just very similar to a lot of cases we see. The policies are very similar to a lot of policies we see. In what's, that, what's similar in these policies to what you usually see? I mean, most group policies nowadays have what's known as a change in definition of disability. That means after a certain time period, um, the defini definition of disability will go from being unable to perform your own occupation to being unable to perform any occupation. And this uh, policy here had, after 24 months, the definition of disability would change. And of course, being able to perform your own occupation is a lower standard than being able to perform any occupation, which basically can be any occupation under the sun, or they might restrict to any occupation based on you know um, your training, education, or experience. And okay, this, and that's very common in the Aetna disability policies that we usually see. And I would have to say probably 99% of the ERISA cases that we have that are from Aetna, the policies, um, have this change in definition after a certain time period. Okay, so was this claimant ever approved at any time? Yes. Um, this claimant was approved for the 24 months. The policy also, I must uh, mention, has what's known as a mental health limitation, which means if you're on claim for disability benefits, Aetna puts in there a limitation saying, um, if you have a mental health condition such as depression, PTSD, um, sometimes schizophrenia might be in this limitation as well, or, or bipolar disorder, they'll only pay you for a certain time period. In this case, it was 24 months as well. So they put a, a monthly limit on how long they will pay you for a mental health uh, condition as well. Okay, in this particular claim, was the mental health condition of depression or PTSD the primary condition that was disabling? It was one of the primary, because the PTSD and depression was one of the primary. The other primary was the colitis and the irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. So Aetna paid this individual, this former employee of Boeing, for two years after he left work in 05. And in 07, they said, um, we no longer find that your IBS or your colitis is disabling. And we uh, also, your PTSD and your depression, while it seems to be still disabling, you've maxed it out. So we're not gonna pay you anymore. Okay, so what happened? So they denied him. Um, after they deny him, the next month, finally his social security disability claim goes through. Um, social security pays him back benefits because they found him disabled from 05 as well. They sent him a gigantic check for $30,000. Um, the next month, Aetna says, hey, uh, congrats on getting approved for Social Security. Uh, we want our money back. And what they're saying is this, and, and the policy I forgot to mention earlier, is that there's a, normally in most of these policies, and very common, I'd say again, 99% of these Aetna policies have what's known as a um, other income benefits is what they describe it as. Also known as the offset provision. The offset provisions. And the offset provision basically says, if you're receiving money from other income, if you're receiving other income, um, we get to deduct that from the amount of money and benefits we pay you each month. Um, typically, other income comes from Social Security disability, Social Security retirement, sometimes uh, workers' comp. Um, sometimes they say anything under the sun. In this case, he started receiving Social Security, and Aetna and this policy had what the um, other income benefits offset provision, and they said, um, we paid you for the last two years X amount of money, um, when we should have been paying you X minus Y right. amount so of money. So this former Boeing employee had bad news after bad news. He was first denied his benefits, and then a couple of months later he gets a letter saying, by the way, you got a proof of Social Security disability, we want our 30000 back. Right, so he thought it was good news, and they're saying, it's good news, but not really, it's good news for us, not for you. So in the meantime, 
he does two things. He begins to file an administrative appeal um, disputing Aetna's decision to deny him, and at the same time, he filed for bankruptcy. About four months after uh, Aetna asked for the overpayment, um, the bankruptcy court issued a discharge order, which basically discharges all of his creditors and, and all the money that he owes to all of his creditors. He doesn't have to pay them anymore. And that included Aetna's Social Security disability claim? Yes, that included Aetna's Social Security overpayment claim as well. Um, after that happened, Aetna went ahead and, and reviewed his appeal that he filed. Aetna said, you know what, we agree with your appeal, we're going to overturn our decision to deny you, however, we're not going to pay you because you owe us X amount of money in overpayment. Um, that went on for about five months where Aetna would not pay but found him disabled, and then Aetna, I don't know why because they weren't paying him, said, you know what, we don't find you disabled again, and they denied him again. Um, to, deny, to, to deny his claim this time, Aetna relied upon um, t uh, a clinical review by one of their in-house doctors, also an, an independent um, doctor who is, I guess, specializes in gastrointestinal issues. And they also relied on these two reviews and sent them to over to a vocational rehab specialist and, and that they hired on their own. It's someone who actually works for them, who said this, um, this claimant can work any occupation. So they denied him All again. All right, so this was his second denial, and then he submitted a second appeal. And did he win on his second appeal? He did not. He submitted a second appeal. And in the second appeal, he, he um, had his own doctor who said, I've never seen a case of IBS as severe as this. Um, he submitted his own vocational rehab specialist report who said this, this guy cannot work, no one would hire him because of the, the amount of, basically the amount of bathroom breaks this, this person has to take during a day that, that no employer in their right mind would hire this person and be able to afford to keep him on with the amount of time he would have to take during the day of breaks. Um, now this wasn't our case, but it sounds like that he submitted some significant additional medical support as well as occupational information for his appeal. That's correct. And um, you know, I, I feel the appeal was very strong, and, but in the end, the district court said that Aetna did not, um, that their decision was not arbitrary and capricious, which is a very high standard to meet. And they said the decision was not arbitrary and capricious. They upheld their decision. And Edna did something weird, or not, excuse me, Edna. The district court did something weird as well, saying we agree or we can't overturn Edna's decision, and we're awarding Edna the overpayment, which is something around $30,000 in overpayment from the Social Security disability benefits. Um, even though, that's, even though the, the bankruptcy court discharges creditors. Right. So after he has the, uh, the judgment against him, the, what the next thing you have to do is appeal to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which, what he, is, which is what he did here. And um, the Tenth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals basically said, uh, again, we can't, Aetna's decision was not arbitrary or capricious, but they said um, that Aetna is not owed that, that overpayment whatsoever. The 30000 Because why? Um, because the, the bankruptcy court had already discharged its creditors. All right, so this claimant ends up, at the end of the day, I mean, it's a, it's a minor victory, but he really got screwed. He did. And he got screwed by these horrible ERISA laws and this arbitrary and capricious standard because the court, whether they agreed or disagreed with, with the claimant's doctors or with Aetna's hired doctors, the court basically could just look at it and say, did Aetna act reasonably? or unreasonably, and if they acted reasonably, then this claimant gets screwed. And, and Alex, you and I talk about this all the time, and it's, it's um, extremely disheartening that these ERISA laws, just, they just suck. They're, just, they're, just, they're not good for people. It's, it's really not fair when you get down to it. And it's a very pro-insurance company law, and I, I don't know, this, this wasn't our case, and I don't know if this claimant had an attorney initially help him with his appeal, but maybe there could have been additional information that he could have submitted and more concrete testing or other things that possibly could have been done to possibly persuade the judge that Aetna didn't necessarily consider all of the information or Aetna isn't being reasonable in saying what other types of occupation he could do. Right. The, uh, the opinion was not clear on um, who his attorney was or if he had an attorney who helped him file the appeal. So we don't know that information. We don't know if there's uh, you know, significant more information he could have filed with his appeal. Um, but at the end of the day, he lost the case, and unfortunately, he will not uh, receive benefits under this policy again. And the other thing I th found significant about this case is that in the actual opinion, you know, it's kind of scary, but the court points out that Aetna has no burden to explain why they're relying on their own physicians or their own experts instead of 
the client's treating physicians or the other experts that the client may hire to, to prove that he is disabled. Right, that's, that's a, a very strong and disturbing point that there's no preference to a treating physician who's seen a claimant 10, 20, or even five times versus an insurance company hired doctor who's never even seen the claimant possibly and only reviews on a re only relies on a report, which is disturbing that there's no preference there. Right, that's why ERISA sometimes is very scary. So if anyone has an Aetna disability claim, you're considering applying for benefits or you need to file a lawsuit, we handle hundreds of these cases every year all around the country. We're happy to review your claim. We offer a free consultation and we're available at any time to discuss your options.